I had said last week that I wanted to teach a series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as I prayed and I found that unless I lay a foundation on prayer first, uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit uh, may not be that relevant. So I will teach instead a series on prayer before we move into the gifts of the Holy Spirit. For uh, in our Christian life, one of the most important things that we want to learn is to pray so that uh, we can pray and learn the secret of the, uh, that the men of God have in the Bible of their communion with God. It's a powerful thing when, you, when we learn how to pray, for if we learn how to pray, we have everything else. Whatever we need, we know how to pray. We have a direct relationship with God. So the, the most important thing for us is to learn how to commune with God in prayer. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, chapter 6, that's right. Matthew. Verse 9 on what? Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus here taught his disciples to pray. It's a simple prayer, a prayer that has been memorized by countless thousands, prayer that has been prayed over many times, and it is a good prayer. And uh, you can use it in your life. But what Jesus brought forth was not only a, uh, a prayer that we can follow, Within that prayer are laws of prayer. In fact, in that one short prayer, there are at least about seven laws of prayer mentioned. That one prayer, Jesus gave it all in a nutshell. And today we only have time to see one. That's the first line here. Jesus said, when you pray, Say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This verse has been sung many times, has been acknowledged and is as famous as Psalm 23 in a secular world. Many songs have this very prayer within it. Yet Christians miss the most basic law of prayer is this that before any prayer can be successful, we must reach a stage where we seek God the Father's blessing and will before our own. But among many Christians and the way they pray, they seek their own comfort and their own needs before the kingdom of God. They put the cart before the horse as far as Jesus is concerned. There are many indications of this when Jesus Christ says in John uh, in Matthew 6 verse 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. He's telling us that, that we should seek first the kingdom of God. That's what Luke says, and his righteousness and all these things you need in this life. Everything you need, your food, your clothing, your shelter, your transportation, and uh, all the needs of your life will be met. If we have to seek the kingdom of God first, that would definitely mean that in our prayer, we will pray the kingdom of God first. Yet it's not always so. Being finite creatures that live on this earth, we sometimes come to God with our needs, bogging us down, laying a burden on our lives so heavy that uh, we just cannot pray anything but our needs. 
And that is the very reason why prayers are not heard and understood. There is a woman in the Bible who have a great need and desire. The story is found in the Old Testament in the book of First Samuel. If you have your Old Testament, please send to the book of First Samuel. If you didn't bring your Bible, try to look as innocent as possible. It's funny you come to a Bible study without Bible. Praise the Lord. And uh, so, in First Samuel, there is a family situation there that is quite familiar to us. Story has been repeated many times over. There is a man, and what is his name? Elkanah. There is a lady, and her name was Hannah. And the other lady, her name was Tanina. So they rhyme together. Alkana, Hannah, and Tanina. But they didn't rhyme together in real life. <laughs> Only their names rhyme. There was a split in the family because Alkana had married two wives. And uh, sometimes when we read the things in the Old Testament, you don't understand how those Old Testament folks got so many wives. And especially when I counsel with uh, men who are thinking of taking another wife and committing adultery, they give their excuse. So Abraham also had. I usually come to them, how about Solomon here, 1,000? <laughs> but this is where the problem is. Do you notice that Jesus said in the beginning it was not so? God did not create Adam, Eve, and Betty. He created only Adam and Eve. So if God has demanded for that, he will have created more. Neither did God create Adam and Eve. So homosexuality is wrong. Neither they got created Samantha and Eve. God created one man, one woman. That was the plan and the perfect plan of God. And just to give you food for thought, do you notice that everywhere, every occasion in the Bible where they have, where men have married more than one wife, they always have problems. Every one of them, literally every one of them. So how can we fail to read and the handwriting on the wall? Even Abraham had problems because he had more than one wife. Men of God. Jacob, every one of them had problems when they had more than one wife. So it doesn't matter whether they're, they're the men of God in the Bible or not, but when there are certain areas in their life that they didn't leave fully right, they got problems. And if you ask any husband, it takes the whole life to deal with one lady. I don't know how they deal with one thousand. <laughs> right? Praise God. And uh, so here, Alkana, Hannah, and Tanina, they have a family problem because Alkana went into the promised of God and uh, had, had uh, uh, another wife. Now, Tanina had children. Hannah had none. What a situation. And in those days, if a woman was barren, she was looked down by society. Children were the pride of the women. Oh, how it has changed today. <laughs> right. I mean, in those days, when a woman had children, they would have a big party and they'd say, Hey, look! <laughs> but how different it is today in today's world. A lot of young people are getting married and they say, oh, we never want to have children anymore. <laughs> what a world of a difference. In those days, it was so important to, to have children. And the Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel, that Hannah, Hannah had a need. She had a tremendous need. And every time there was a feast, she went there in Jerusalem, and look at verse 5. To Hannah, he would give a double portion for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. 
and her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Understand how the Bible writes it. See, when you read the Old Testament, you must have this understanding that there is a special sense in the Bible called the Promises. Where many times you read, and the Lord sent an evil spirit to Saul. And the Lord had closed their womb. When they wrote that, they used a special tense in the Hebrew that we don't have in the English, where it, it shows more that generally they take everything that happened as a permissive will of God. Must, you must understand two things in the Old Testament, the language and the, the, the difference in Revelation. In the Old Testament, whenever something happened, whether good or bad, they say, Insha'Allah. Sounds familiar? God's real. So a robbery, robbery takes place, you know. People fighting. <laughs> you fellows die. Newspapers will come up. Insha'Allah. It was the will of God that the person died. So that was the same concept that they had in the Old Testament. Anything that happened. The reason is in the Old Testament, Satan was not exposed yet. So people didn't know there was a Satan. Even out there today in the world, there are a lot of good people outside who say, if really there's a God, how can all this evil happen? They forget that there's a devil. And so the New Testament is not only a revelation of God, but it's an exposure of Satan. Suddenly the peace is found. He's caught and he's dead. For all Job didn't know Satan caused his problem. And uh, so, uh, understand that terminology when he says that the Lord sent, and so I have illustrated that before in comparing scriptures. But just for the sake of those of you here, let me just compare one scripture and just take uh, uh, one minute and side side so that I establish this principle before we go on. Turn to the book of Second uh, Samuel. Second Samuel, chapter 24, verse 1. Again the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now we use the same word. Do you see that it says the Lord, the Lord moved against David? But if you look at First Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1, same incident recorded in Chronicles. See, Chronicles records the spiritual side of things. Although many stories are the same as kings, but they record the spiritual side. First Chronicles 21 verse 1. Who did you say it was? Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number. You see that? It's the same incident, but that's just to show you how some of the styles of their writing in the Old Testament. That if you only read part of it and you don't read the whole concept and you don't understand the second thing about it, about the Hebrew tense, that when they say the Lord did this, the Lord closed uh, Hannah's womb, uh, we would think that the Lord personally came and took the key and then went off. And the devil had nothing to do with that. Every suffering of humanity, every curse that man has suffered, or whether of sickness or oppression, the devil is directly or indirectly involved. What about God? God is totally looking at the situation of, and more protecting us. Now in the Old Testament, when they write things like that, they will always say the Lord. Every circumstance that happens, they say the Lord, because their meaning is the Lord had allowed. For us, we must understand the law allow because men allow. So the first question you decide is the Lord allow. It's not the Lord actually sent. It's the Lord allow. The Lord allow. When you settle that, then you have to settle the second thing. Why did the Lord allow? 
And in every situation there was a permissive law, there was a law of God broken. There, was, there is always a broken law whether it's natural, social, soul or spiritual. There is always a broken law involved before God allows. Now let's go back here to Hannah. Hannah, Hannah here has no children and you see how she went uh, she was very miserable in verse 6. In her misery, Penina also, you know, took advantage of that and provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed the womb or allowed it to be closed. So it was year by year. Oh, I don't know how long she suffered. When she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she went and did not eat. Every year, every year, there was this lady always to talk, to talk, to talk, you know. See, you see, you see, you got nothing, you see, you see, the Lord is not blessing you, you see, the Lord is with me. And uh, this, Anna would least go to the temple every year with her eyes red, tears flowing, and the story is repeated many, many times every year until, until Elkanah, who was actually responsible himself, was so frustrated that he came to Hannah and said, Am I not better to you than, uh, than our children? That's what he said. You know? Like most men, they don't take the responsibility. It started with Adam and Eve. God said, Do you eat the fruit of the woman? <laughs> the woman you gave me. It takes a, a real man to accept blame too. So in verse 8, Alkana said, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? He was also responsible. He broke the law of God and he took more than one wife. But in the situation we see almost like a uh, nominal Christian. There they are with their problems in God, coming to God's house. Every Sunday cry, Oh Lord, when will you ever hear me? That's why we are teaching this tonight. There are a lot of Christians who are crying to God and today they are wondering why God never hear me. In fact, they have at first they come to God, they, they cry to God. They think the louder they cry, the faster God hears. <laughs> if that is needed, buy an amplifier system. <laughs> so at first they come very humbly and they cry, God, hear me, hear me. And He never seemed to hear. I mean, there they are with their burdens. God, can you see my frustration, my anguish, and my suffering year after year? Silence from heaven. <laughs> Do you know that silence is very frustrating? If you ever experience it, at least if you say no, you, you are heard from him. But when the silence from heaven, you feel. Some people pray and they got silence from heaven, they feel even more frustrated. And then the tone in the prayer start changing. They start blaming God. You know? God, you do all these things. Why do you allow all these things? They change. They tried tactic number two. Thinking that the more they, they blame God, God would be so convicted of his sins that he will quickly come and answer your prayers. Say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I did this to you. But after some years of doing that, God's response is, Silence from heaven! I tell you, he put up with a lot of us. And when our tactic number two failed, we try tactic number three. We bargain with God. God, God, I'll be a good Christian on this day for it. Just answer this one thing. But the Lord God reminded them that He answered many times in His day for God. But here is where Hannah reached the point and her prayers can only be answered when it came to this day. She began to stop thinking about herself. 
That's what I want to encourage you Christians, where your prayers were hindered. Why your prayers are not heard. She reached a point where she stopped thinking about herself to certain extent. And she saw the temple around her. And the same principle was there. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. She began to look at the Lord's work. At the Lord's ministry. Before that she was saying, Lord, deliver me. Lord, Lord, I need a son. I need, I need desperately. She reached the point where she said, Lord, I give you the son. Give me a son that I can give to you. So number one, we see her reaching the point where she was thinking about the things of God and seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So unless you break loose from introspection and uh, from the bondage of our own needs we cannot break through to have the attention of heaven as she broke through that barrier and she began to say Lord give me a son for thy glory she's no more she still has those needs but now she could see that she does not just want God to answer her prayer and her needs. She wants the prayer to be answered in such a way that God's kingdom will be expanded. So every year when she went to the, to the temple, she will see the priest there dressed gloriously, functioning in all their religious activities. It never occurred to her until that day. Until one day it occurred to her that she could have a son not only to meet her need, but she could think in terms of God's need. And that is very sacrificial if you understand what it is. You see, it involves a surrender of her need. Any mother who gives birth to a child wants to bring the child up, wants to nurture the child, wants to see the child grow in their own home. And she saying, no, she doesn't need the child now. All she wants is just to give birth, have the child for some time and give it to God. She thought of God's kingdom. That's when heaven starts hearing. That's the first thing. She begins to look heavenward. Her needs do not bound her anymore. Secondly, she approached God with the perspective of giving and not receiving. And that's the second big hindrance involved, as you see in people's lives, in prayers. When they come to God, they come with the attitude of uh, receiving. Receiving. God is actually Santa Claus. Right? And we just come with little children, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And that is one of the big hindrances why many people's prayers remain unanswered. They are like Hannah. Crying every day, crying every year and saying, Lord, why didn't you hear me? Why didn't you hear me? Because they never thought about what they can give to God. But they always remember what God can give to them. And that was the blockage. So she began to come out of her fellow shell and began to think in terms of the kingdom of God and began to say, God, I give to you. And 
there was a surrender. Under the second point, to come to the stage where you are thinking about what you can give to God and not what God can give to you, there is an element of surrender that has taken place. Remember that this woman was thinking of giving God the greatest, deepest longing and desire of her life. After so many years, that she longed, she prayed, she cried, she wept for a child. I'm sure the child coming will be the most precious, precious thing on earth. And she reached a point where before that, she even has a child, she says, Lord, this desire that I've been nurturing so much, that I could understand that she would be, probably be able to say that she would die to have that to feel. Even if she gave birth and she died, she would be fulfilled. Yet the, the greatest desire of her heart, she could come to God and say, God, I give it to you. And on that day, I'm sure there were many tears, but the tears were now different. They were tears of a surrendered heart and a surrendered life. We human beings don't surrender easily. We don't. I can tell you, we fight before we surrender. That is why the Holy Spirit cannot use people easily. Not because he's not easy to work with. He's so gentle. Such a wonderful person. The most wonderful person you ever met. Or because we human beings struggle too much. God says, surrender. He says, no. Surrender, no. And they fight with teeth and nails. We God before we surrender. And many times God leaves us alone. And, and then we knock our heads against the wall. And we reach a point where we say, God, we cannot do it anymore. And God comes out and waiting for that all the time. We think to you give up. It just reminds me of the story of a man who was walking by the lake one day. And as he was passing by the lake with his friend, they were talking. And then there was a cry in the lake that says, Help! Help! I'm drowning! Help! And uh, they, one, of them, one of them was a seaman, the other was not. So the non seamer said, Come on, quickly, let's go! Help! And uh, this seamer just walked, or they come to the edge of the lake, sit there watching. And his non seamer was very panicking, his hair was all, you know, I think he was passing by that time. <laughs> okay, come on, Ooh, why don't you jump in? Come on, come on, jump in! You forgot your swimming trunks or what? Come on! <laughs> and uh, so, these men are just waiting until the, the help is, help! Help! Say, come on, you're gonna let him die, you're guilty of second degree murder. <laughs> So the non seamen getting panicky. And finally, when this person uh, almost says, No more breath, this person suddenly jumps in and pulls him out. And then, when he brought this person and applied artificial resuscitation, all the water coming out, this non seamen says, I don't understand you. Oh, why are you going into this level of swallow so much water? And enjoy seeing his, all this. And finally, this seaman said, If I had jumped in earlier, there may have been two people who would be drowned. The person will fight and struggle so much that I was drowned too. But he has to wait until the person stops drowning. You know, people who don't know how to swim, they throw them in the water, they clutch at the straw. They won't know how to cooperate with the, with the last guy. So the same way, God, except that God doesn't get drowned. But why does He wait for our surrender? Because He's a gentleman. He's a perfect gentleman. He will not violate our free view to say no. The devil will. That's why He's tempting people. But God will never. He loves us so much. 
And so, God wait for that moment of surrender and comes into our lives. And say, God, why didn't you answer earlier? See, there was this second hindering. That unless we reach the point where we think about what we can give to God, not in the sense that we can give anything that is worthy or anything that should gain His merit, but the giving part is more a surrender that takes place. But only in that, that posture of surrender can the prayers be heard and answered. And when I reach that point, where she said, God, I'm willing, I'm willing, and she's thinking, number one, she thought about the kingdom of God first. Number two, she thought about what she can do for God. She's reaching out of her shell now. Instead of focusing on her problems, she's now reaching out to think about what she can do. And there are many Christians who are too bottled down by their own problems. If they only take time to maybe help other people, they will probably get themselves healed too. See, we're too inward looking. And the more you look inwardly, the more problems there are. Sometimes, sometimes the uh, Christians are like the old Greeks, you know, the Greeks. If you study uh, the rise of the Greek Empire, if you still remember your school historical books, the Greek, the Greek tribes that were there before they were united under Alexander's father, Alexander the Great's father, they were a warring force. When there were no threat from outside, they fight with each other all the time. But when there's a threat from outside, suddenly they are united to fight the outside. And sometimes, Christians are that way, when, they, when it looks like we have lost our zeal for the Great Commission, we, we forget about reaching the needs of the world, we forget, forget about meeting the others, but when we begin to focus on me, my, and I, then suddenly we look around and everybody is an enemy, we come to church with the force, and we fight. <laughs> suddenly there's a threat from the outside, persecution threatens to come. Suddenly all the Christians drop their sword and pray together. For the first time. So it's funny. Why does that happen? There's too, sometimes there's too much inward looking. We need to look outward to the needs that are around us. We need to look outward to the, king, to the things that the kingdom of God, the vision, the things that, that need to be done. There's too much work to be done in the kingdom of God for us to sit down and find each other. Too much work. Our enemy is taken. We must not be flesh and blood. And so here, here is Hannah. She reached a point where she reached out of her introspection and she thinks about giving. What can I give to God? What can I give to God? How many of your prayers you could change into that? How many of your prayers have, have you come to God and it's one sided? But the same prayers when you begin to ask the Holy Spirit to show you how you could come in line with these laws of prayer. When you begin to think about what you can give to God, what you can do for God, how you can surrender yourself to God to do His will. Suddenly, without a struggle, the needs in your life that you've been longing to be met all the time are met. And you're so busy in God's work and you say, hey, God has met my needs and wow, what a wonderful God He is. And then the other Christians will look at Him and say, wow, why God like Him doesn't like me? Doesn't understand the truth, how the laws have been fulfilled. Remember that for God to be what He is, that is, He is no respecter of persons. He needs to relate to us through just laws by which whoever fulfills will be able to receive. That's the only basis for an impartial relationship with us. And God is impartial. He loves us all the same. And what we uncover tonight is that there are these small intricate laws of prayer that have been kept that have brought the answer. Now when we look on the outside, we don't realize 
What is in more? There are laws. There are laws. The second, that she started thinking of what she can give to God, not what God can give to her. Let me read the scriptures now in the book of First Samuel, chapter one, verse ten. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maid servant and remember me and not forget your maid servant, but will give your maid servant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she was drowned. So for the first time, she prayed that way. And then Eli was there. He was one of the fattest men in the Bible. Not the fattest, but one of the fattest. And uh, he was there. And you know Eli, he is not a very spiritual man. He's not. His name sounds very oily or so. Eli. <laughs> Eli. And uh, so, Eli, here he is. His children are committing adultery in the tabernacle itself. You must know how corrupted the church is at that time. Uh, the church in those days. If you could get a miracle out of that kind of church, it must be fantastic. <laughs> but look at the condition of the church. There were three things that were against Hannah. I mean, it looked even more impossible that the Lord could ever answer to that system. But here, you see the first thing is in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 12. The sons of, his, of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And these people were serving as priests, right? It was a religious ceremony to them. They didn't know the Lord. Not only did they know the, didn't know the Lord, the Bible tells us they were very greedy. You see, during the sacrifices, I, I'm not reading to them, but you can read in that verse that follow. When people bring the offering to the Lord, some of it had to be born, some of it had to be roasted, and uh, before it was finished, before it was cooked, here they come with their chef hat, their fork, their meat, meat fork, and they come, and while it was burning, and the person was... And from the corner of his eye, he heard footsteps. He is this priest, and uh, he even has his napkin already <laughs> waiting to eat the food. And uh, as this guy was praying, worshiping God, he would take his talk. And he said, Oh, hey, that's my offering! <laughs> that's my offering! Supposed to burn to God, he, he was taking it away. He said, Oh, uh, we prefer you roast that, lah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and off they went. And it went on all the time. They didn't know the Lord. Imagine in that kind of setup, Hannah is just praying to the Lord. Oh, such a devout woman. What an empty, what a, a contrast. Not only are these sons of uh, Eli that way, the Bible tells us here, in uh, verse 17, the sin of this young man oh, was very great in the sight of the Lord. Very, very great. And uh, <clears throat> you see, also in chapter 2, verse 22, Now Eli was old and he had everything his sons did to all Israel, how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of Midian. And in all these things, when there were people, women who came, they took some of them and, and they had immoral acts with them. In the temple! And all these laws, here comes Hannah praying, Oh Lord, I'm making this vow to you. In the midst of all this ungodliness, and they are the priests. They are the priests. And Eli, the fat father, he has said, Oh no, my la, oh my la. Hey, this is serious before the Lord. 
he didn't discipline his children, he should remove them. Instead of saying, oh, never mind, they are my sons and just leave them. Let me tell you, in the things of God, there is no such thing as, uh, as a dynasty. And uh, so then he responds that way. There was a father that way. There was a son that way. Two, two hindrances. Plus, in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, there was no widespread revelation in those days. People don't know the Lord, nor do they know the word of the Lord. And in the midst of all these things, in a cor- corrupt religious group, there is Hannah making a vow to the Lord. Lord, what can I give to your kingdom? I want to serve you. I, w- I want my children to serve you. And of all things, in chapter 1, you see this Eli, with all this background behind him, looking at Hannah, and you know, what you see in other people is what you yourself are many times. Let me repeat that. What you see of others is what you are many times. People who go around and think that people are interested in money is because they themselves are interested in money. They are seeing through the eyeglasses of their own making. You tend to see in others your own greatest witnesses. So watch it. The next time you do, sometimes people will come and say, Oh, you're proud! You know, these people are proud. Yeah, it's proud. And everybody in the side. But they themselves are the most obnoxious character. And uh, so here's Eli with all this background, with this eat, drink, and be merry philosophy. He comes and says, this woman and oh, 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 oh. didn't even give her the benefit of the doctor she must be drunk. She just came from a drinking party, that's well in the in the in the in the flesh like that. Oh, 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 oh. She must be drunk. And he must have spoken it aloud and this and now here he was, and this he was making a dedication to the Lord. He said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm praying to the Lord. And in all this See religiosity, eh? the Lord could work through it. I marvel. In all these things, is it, there is literally very little blessing. If there, if there was any spirit there, maybe it was, it was just one tiny atom. But that one tiny word. The Hannah's position was such that she could reach out and take all that is there that is available. In the Old Testament, only the kings, priests, and uh, prophets had the Holy Spirit. But so, such was her position that God didn't even need to send an angel from heaven. See, when God answers your prayer, how fast He answers and the mode by which He answers is more determined by our receptivity than by God. In this time, in that kind of contact in the temple, in such corruption, the voice of God was very blur. In fact, there was near. Yet there were sincere people who came. And in that atmosphere, whatever little blessing there was left in the temple, Hannah could draw, draw upon it. And Eli said, Let it be according to your word. For the first time, after all those years in prayer, the peace of God came. Have you ever prayed and prayed and prayed and cried and prayed and cried and wept? And when you go to this two states where you stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about God, hello be thy name. And then thinking about what you can give to the Lord. And surrender to Him. There is a peace that comes. It's called the peace of answered prayer. What a shock Alkana must have. Every year her face was as long as a papaya, dragging it all along on the ground. Uh, world's longest papaya show. Every day she put on a show, a great show, you know, not a fashion show, papaya show. You know, dragging it, every day crying, all the way to Jerusalem and all the way back. Oh, 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 oh every year. But that year the papaya was harvested. After she finished the prayer, suddenly she came back bright as a, as a, a dark. 
something must have happened huh? See, it takes this to bring about an answered prayer same element I could give you many other Bible, sto- Bible stories to show the same things that took place that's only when people turn away from themselves and to the Lord do prayers get answered and some prayers are long standing it was revival and Hannah went back let's read in first Samuel chapter 1 she says let your maid servant find favor in your sight so the woman went her way and ate for the first time she ate and her face was no longer sad for the first time when they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord returned and came to their house and exactly a year later normal time of pregnancy Hannah conceived and bore a son question why was the prayer answered now when it was not answered for so many years she, she has released one of the major laws of prayer one of the major laws of prayer she has released one of the major laws of prayer then she has reached out like Jesus teaches Father who are in heaven focus on God first Hallowed be thy name Hallowed be thy name think about God first and involved in that was the surrender to give something to God's kingdom and then she was changed she had a son but that's not the end do you know when you pray for answer that's not the end it's only a beginning she remembered her promise I mean it would have been the easiest thing when the child came to know her the struggle not to get released a child I mean the child was about two years old and she had to bring the child to a temple two or three when the child was weaned the desire of her heart has come and now she surrendered it because she prayed and she known it was the Lord she kept her part she kept her part she kept her word and God will many times watch to see whether you do it or not I know that many times people pray Lord bless my business but God started blessing them in certain ways to see whether they will be faithful to little when they are not she knows they won't be faithful in, they, they won't be faithful in much and many people will say Lord Lord just just bring 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 my loved ones my wife or my husband to the Lord my children to the Lord and I serve you all the rest of your day one day the Lord brings them and then they say oh no nah, now we are we got so we sacrificing so much for the church now oh no 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 they forget their part to pull it through what they have said to the Lord and sometimes some of the ladies pray very hard for their husband oh Lord save the sinner <laughs> and uh, they pray so wonderfully and, they, and, and, and God never hear them for all this maybe 40 years they pray, Lord, save him, save him, save him, and cry and weep and complain. I wonder why God never hear my prayer. One day they go to the same state. The Lord, I stop thinking about my own need. Lord, I pray that you will, you, you, you use him in your own way. Right? And the people like that, Jerry Savell, he was a car mechanic. His wife came to know the Lord. She prayed for him. And one day, I've seen this happen many times over and over again, the story is repeated. Husband get converted, turn on to the Lord. The wife used to attend just three times a week. Now the husband suddenly got turned on, he was to attend seven days a week. <laughs> I said, no lah, why you must be so fanatic? I pray, I wanted you to pray until you be like me. <laughs> but 
But now you turn on to the Lord, you go answer their prayer abundantly. <laughs> now they want to go to church seven days a week. Say, come on, come on, you must go, come on. And they say, oh no. And uh, then they go, but it's a blessing to the Lord and it's a blessing to their lives in the end. And that is where Hannah kept her word and the Lord answered. She brought the child. It must be a sacrifice. But you must understand how mothers are with their children. It's a great surrender to, to surrender yourself to someone whom you see only once a year or so. It's a great surrender. I mean, I admire that woman that she mean what she said to the Lord. And you know what the Lord did? That's the third principle that we learn. You can never outgive God. You can never outgive God and outdo Him. When she brought that son to the Lord, the Bible says she has sons. I mean, now every year she has one. Oh, what a great rejoicing. Every year she has one. And I wonder what, what Selena is doing now. Getting her head. You know? Suddenly this Hannah, from the day that she was converted from, uh, uh, from a papaya to a, in an apple or something, she came back with a smile and a glow on her cheek. Suddenly, there is all this abundance of children that came in. You can never outgive God. When your prayers are heard, it's only the beginning of what God wants to do in your life. See, God is not interested in just answering your prayer. He's interested in having a relationship with you. He's not interested to be just your supermarket. He wants to be a father to you. He wants a relationship with you, which is where we prayed earlier in our prayer. As we open this Bible study. God, God's main desire with us is He wants to show us how good He is to us. See, in Genesis, every time He has made something, He says, And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. It's repeated so many times that we may consider it redundant. Yet the Holy Spirit has a purpose for recording it there. And when God made man, it says, God saw that it was very good. He did not make man on the first day and then say, Alright, Adam and Eve, go and work now. Bring all those things in. No. He finished everything and then he made man. So that man could enjoy his goodness. God does not just want to answer one of your prayers. Two of your prayers. He wants you to know he is your daddy. He is your father. He wants to be a revelation. A revelation of his goodness into your life. That is where Jesus came and revealed the nature of God to us in fullness. That He is our Father. The book of Romans 8 tells us that we all cry when the spirit of adoption is in us. We cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba, Father is the same Greek word that we would use to say Daddy. 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 Of course, in Asia, we call each other differently. Right? What do you call your father? Dad. Okay. What do you call your father? Papa. Right? We Asia call slightly differently. Right? You don't call your father Mr. Jones? You know, what kind of relationship you have? We don't. But we call our father, you know, that, that sweet name, whatever word. I used to call my father Pa, right? Because we are not, you know, uh, Westerners, so we don't, we don't use the word daddy so much. So I used to say Pa. Most Asians, they probably will use Papa. You know, Papa, you know, Papa. Now, I want you to bring the same concept to your relationship with God. 
See, we don't have the impact of it when we read Romans 8. Because we see a Greek word, and the spirit of adoption comes to you and we call Abba, Father. The word Abba is an official word like Hosanna and Hallelujah. See? So we don't understand that what Paul was writing was he's using one of those sweet family words like Papa to convey on the relationship that God has with us. And when God got that revelation into my life, it changed me. My relationship with God changed. When I was first born again, I knew God as my Savior. I thought that's enough. I know He is God, my Father. But the word Father is a capital S. It's official. Very official. And so, one day, as I grew in my walk with the Lord, the Lord began to say, I want to be a daddy to my people. And I struggle within myself. See, I am a very serious Christian in my relationship with the Lord. I, mean, I, I want to please Him. Say, God, and in my prayer, you know, uh, Father God. You know, what a nice title to Him. And when God spoke to me, He said, Don't do away with all those titles. I said, oh, Then we'll get behind me. <laughs> oh, this is the <laughs> And, uh, so I struggle. You know, it's not easy. We struggle. We struggle. And then finally the first words come in my private devotion with God. Say, God. Say, Papa God, I love you. And then when I say that, I feel a bit my sixth blessing. Eh? So I'm almost ashamed to call him Papa. And then the Holy Spirit tells me, say, why are you ashamed? I don't know. See, we humans, we keep God at arm's length. Some keep God on, at, at a ten-foot pole. Right? Official. Church is official. Christianity is official. Prayer life, official. Devotion, all already official. I know that there is an official aspect to it. But we must know the intimate aspect so the official would have a greater meaning. And so I struggle. I fought... With my training, my society training, my upbringing. And then I just went, Papa. Did the angel hear me? I struggle. And then as I call him, something happened within me. I broke down and wept before him. And I felt. I felt a lot of healing taking place in me. You see, deep in the hearts of every human being, they want love. And God actually designed the family so that the family will provide a certain measure of that love. But most of us grow up without it, especially Asians. Now, thank God, when you're born again, our family life is different. We, we, we dare to be more affectionate. But I was brought up in a typical Chinese family, typical Asian family, where we never hug, we never kiss, and I never ever, my father is already in heaven, but I have never ever heard him say one, I love you. I know he did. But he must have thought too shy to say that, being Asian. And it was not one-sided. I also never said that to him. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm rather right senior son, huh? I want to, you know, uh, uh, honor him. Uh, when I was in the seminary, God dealt with my life. God says, you have never said that to your father. And he was not born again yet. Those days. I said, I said, no, it's so difficult. Do you know, it's easy to cross the ocean, you know, fight the sharks and the gorillas, go into the jungle, you know, you know fight the spears, fight the snakes, get to the jungle and be a missionary. Then you go to your own parents, your own father and say, I love you. So I struggled. 
And in the end, I said, Lord, all right, are you, are you? And I went back. When I was on holidays in seminary, I went back and my father was there. And uh, sitting on the chair as usual, doing some reading, usually the papers. Said, say, Pa. <laughs> Lord, please. <laughs> His usual way, he's a rough and tough. My father works in the police, uh, in the police headquarters in JB. And he's tough. Uh, I'm not in his image, definitely. He's big and tough, ready skin, right? Tough man. And um, so he's uh, in his rough voice. And uh, for my childhood, I know he's, he has a very fierce temper. I mean, his temper blows up, you know. It was like a tribulation. <laughs> so. And he was struggling with Pa. Ah, what do you want? No, I didn't come to ask for money. I didn't come to ask for anything. And I struggled. I said, Pa, uh, pa I just want you to know. I've never said this to you. But I want you to know that uh, I love you. As quick as possible. <laughs> I went out. My face started blushing. I mean, you don't blush on some things, but you start blushing on those things. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what happened after that. But something changed in my father. One month later, he came to know the Lord. He never said that to me. Thank God when I'm in heaven, that's one of the first things he's always say back to me. I never had a chance. And uh, very shortly after that, he went home to be with the Lord. So, that's uh, the struggle. And I find that that's inside every heart. Many of people's character problems today as an adult are environmentally caused. Love has been deprived. And when love is deprived, they can go to any extreme. They can either be withdrawn and they have an inferiority complex, or they become so outgoing, they have emptiness inside. You know, very talkative and, and very outgoing, trying to hide something that is lacking inside. So many of people's funny character quirks and personality problems today is because they have never been touched in the innermost core of their being. They have never actually been loved the way they should have been loved. But when you meet the Father God and He answers your prayer and you are faithful to Him, don't stop there. He does not just want to answer your prayers. He wants to come into your life so that you will know that any time you have any problem, He is Papa. And daddy. I want you to go back tonight and be quiet with the Father. If you have never found your relationship with Him, your daddy, you have not known the fullness of God. You have only known the outward part, God Almighty. But you have never known the depth of his being at heart. Some of you may struggle like me. But the day you could come to the Father and say, Papa. You know, in my private prayer, just very frankly opening my life to you, I call him Papa from that day onwards. And I have a close relationship with him. He is my Papa. Incidentally, I also don't have any more early father. So he is my papa. And I call him papa. Outside, when I'm preaching and ministering, I pray officially. <laughs> right? The, why do I do that? Because people who are not taught, you see, after we sit through this teaching, I teach you tonight, then I share this truth. You know, it comes just, just nicely. Like after the blue, let's say in a stadium where I'm having evangelistic meeting, I say, Papa God. <laughs> right? People won't understand. They won't understand, right? But when you pray, Father God, Almighty God, they will say, Amen, Amen, Amen. That's all the official. But in my prayer life, that I, I pray because my desire and my minister is I want people to know my Father. 
And I, uh, my greatest desire is that each one of you relate closely to him. So you could reach out to him in that manner. And when I pray my private life, I say, Papa God, Papa God. And from that day onward, I had a relationship with him deeper than before. Very much deeper than before. So that's the third area in prayer. And getting our prayers answered, where we discover that He not only wants to answer our prayer, but behind it is He wants us to know Him. No father would buy things for the children just for the sake of meeting the children's needs. No mother would do that either. Those of you who have children, you know it. You, you know that your children get hungry, they need food. Your children. You know, they grow up and they need uh, new clothing because they outgrow their old clothing. They have needs. But what's the purpose of your family? Not that your children will know that you will meet their needs, but that your children will know that you love them as your very own flesh. That is why Jesus teaches to pray in his first prayer very unlike the Old Testament in the New Testament he teaches when you pray say Abba Father and the word Father is the word in the Greek word Pate it's the same close word too Pate Hemon Ho and Kios Urenon our Father who are in heaven Hallowed be thy name. So, God wants us to know Him, our Father. Our Father. First Lord, prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh, Father. What a loving Father you are. Amen. Just sense that presence of the Spirit right where you are. I love to minister to your life now. Many hurts in your life. Right where you are, I just like you to just sit in a comfortable position in surrendering to the Lord. I lead you in a prayer that the love and the revelation of the Father may come into your life. The seat in your seat and open your palms towards him. You can lift up your hands. If your hands get tired, just lay them on your lap with the palms open to God in a posture of surrender and in reception. Say, Father God, reveal yourself to me. Not only as Almighty God, but as my father, as my papa, the one who loves me, the one I can run to. And when no one can understand me to the fullest, not even my parents or my loved ones, you can understand the death of my life. For you are also my Creator. So, Father, I open my life to You, to Your love. I recognize tonight that my greatest need is not for things, nor is it for the answer to my prayer. But my greatest need is to be loved. To burn in the fullness of your love. And tonight I open my heart to you. To allow you to love me. And to feel every vacuum in my life which were in existence when I came into this world 
and even as I grow up in this world, feel the vacuum in my life with your love. Let me know over and over again how much you love me. And Father, I want to say it now and say it over and over again that I love you too. Tonight, I want to know you as my Papa, my Daddy. And I'm just a child to be held in your arms, to be loved by you, to enjoy your goodness and your love for me. Heal all my inner hurt in my life. Make me whole again. Let my personality, the true personality that I should have, that I should possess will arise and people will see the person whom you have created me to be. In Jesus' name, I love you. I love you. Just pray quietly for a moment. Just be right where you are. If you be his love while I pray for you, Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would feel that love. The love of the Father. The unconditional love, Father. I pray that you feel that love in each heart in each life. All those hurts and loneliness are being washed away. All those rejections are being washed away. Ah, God's love is washing your life by the snow, pouring an abundance of His love through you. Feel your love. Feel your love in His life. In His life, Holy Spirit, blow across this place. And reveal the presence of the Father and the love of the Father to each one in a special way. In Jesus' name, Amen.